Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading Garden Fork Radio. My name is Eric. I talk here with my friends about eclectic DIY gardening, how to stuff we've encountered, challenges we're having. And today I've got my friend Aaron from the magnificent YouTube channel, The Impatient Gardener, and we're going to talk about a giant urn. Right, Aaron? That's right. So I... My producer tells me that I'm supposed to jump right into the topic, whereas Garden Fork is kind of like we talk a little bit and then we start the topic. So I'm curious, everybody, what you all think about whether Aaron and I should have a little back and forth, how you doing, how, you know, what you've been working on, or should we just jump into this giant urn that you ordered? You have any thoughts, Aaron? Yeah, my thoughts are we should go straight to the urn. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. You don't want to hear about my meditation this morning or what I had for breakfast or. Well, sure. I mean, if it's <laughs> if it's inter- if it's interesting information that you think is pertinent to urns, absolutely. <laughs> no, but a little backstory: you you and I have been uh, texting about this large object objet de art that is going to show up at your house and it, and it showed up. It showed up. So what, yeah, it, why, why a big urn? Okay. So I have a, uh, in the middle smack dab in the middle of my garden, right off the patio, I have currently uh, sort of an urn, a wide, it's a wide bowl shaped urn on a pedestal. And, and all of these things should be, put in imaginary quotation marks because this was a very cobbled together DIY thing. The pedestal is actually a pot I bought at Target and turned upside down. The urn is a fiberglass urn I found pretty cheap online. And I had put it there because I needed something in that spot in the garden. This was several years ago. And I just really liked it. And now it's become something I really like in that spot in the garden. Well, the one problem with the urn that I had there was that it was a little on the small side and it has been gradually, it breaks a little bit more every year and we keep epoxying it back together. <laughs> and then this fall, it took a fall and it, and it lost it. The urn became a bowl, except it's a bowl with no bottom in it anymore. Yes. So it has, it has run its course and I thought, okay, well, now it's time to replace this and get something that's properly situated. There's always a little, what's been there has always been a little tippy too, I should add, uh, which is not a big deal because it's fiberglass, whatever. The worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to fall over and crush another plant. So um, I just decided to go for it and I ended up getting a stone urn, very large stone urn that sits on a fairly big stone pedestal to go in the middle of the garden so I can plant this up as sort of a centerpiece of the garden. And the, the listed weight. Now the, the good news about this is, is that I don't believe, I think the listed weight might've been like a shipping weight, not an actual weight or something Mm -hmm. because um, none of nothing seems as heavy as what it was supposed to be. But the listed weight on this is 280 pounds for the pedestal and 420 pounds for the urn. Wow. <laughs> right, which 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 adds up as some math astute listeners might have already figured up to 700 pounds. I don't think again, I don't think it's that much. Um and fortunately, the pedestal came in three parts and the urn came in two parts with the bowl and then kind of like this thing that it stands on. Mm-hmm. So, the good news is is that in term the situation of placing this got a little bit easier because of that. Um, and there's no way that pedestal weighs 280 pounds because we were able to move those pieces around. And even though there were three pieces, they weren't that heavy. So, oh, so the good news is maybe we're looking at more like, like 500 or 600 pounds, still significantly heavier than about, I don't know, 30 pounds that I had in there before. So is the stone, is it, like manufactured stone where it's poured into a mold or it's actual stone that the, the urn has been carved from. 
No, it's a manufactured stone. It's like a, it's kind of like a sandstone kind of thing. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the good news is, is that it's um, resistant to freezing and frost and stuff. So I should be able to place this thing and I'll never have to worry about it. Um, at least I think it's guaranteed against frost for 10 years. So that's pretty good for me. That is um, good. But yeah, it's a manufactured product in a mold, basically. I get. I guess urns are used in a garden to bring f- your eye to a certain area, and also kind of to shake things up because everything else is can be low and high in their plants. But then you're you're able to take plants that might be small and kind of put them literally put them on a pedestal. And I watching your videos, you switch out the design of that urn more than once a year. Yeah. Off, oh yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's definitely twice a year. I definitely do a summer and a winter. Um, sometimes I will do an in between spring kind of thing, or if something's not looking great in fall, I'll pull it out and stick, you know, just like part of it, I'll change out. And is there any special kind of soil you have to put in there or urn just soil? Just the same. <laughs> nope. Just the same potting mix you'd use in any container planting is fine. I um my yard is uh, uh what I call chaos gardening uh since we're only up at the little house here on the weekends and I don't have that much time to garden I'm just happy I have potatoes and garlic planted you know um but I don't know we have an apple tree that might die and then we could put a urn in the middle of this little there's like bee balm and cone flowers and stuff like that that are in this one bed and we could stick an urn in there and have something kind of fancy and formal there there you go i I mean i love container i love plunking containers whether they're just like a regular big pot or an urn or whatever i just love plunking containers around the garden because it is something it does break things up a little bit you know and does kind of and it does offer a different way to do some plantings and something different like like this year i'll do a colocasia in that urn um, and, you know, I'm not sure that a colocasia stuck. Well, first of all, if I stuck a colocasia in that spot without the urn, it would just get swallowed up by the rest of the garden. But also, I'm not sure that would necessarily look right in my garden. It would really stand out. But when it's in a container, I think it's OK to have it be sort of dramatically different from what's happening in the garden. So I have a uh, layman question, but what's a colocasia? Elephant ears. Oh, I know what those are. <laughs> Sorry. Well, now you've got me thinking because also you could put in urns plants that are not winter hardy and then you could just pull them out. You could literally put a pot within the urn and just lift that pot back out and take it inside for the winter. That's actually how I plant a lot of things in in that spot. That's how I've done the – in fact, almost every time I do a centerpiece in there, I pot it in a pot within the pot either because I want to be able to do exactly what you just said is pull it out and bring it in or because it needs slightly different um, soil conditions than the rest of the stuff that I'm putting in there. Or in the case of like an ornamental grass that I did a few years ago, some of those ornamental grasses grow so quickly and so vigorously that they will eat the whole root volume in the pot. If you don't contain them, they will take, they will take up as much room as you give them. They'll look great either way, but they take up as much room as you can give them. And so if you don't contain that within there, anything else you plant in there with it will eventually just get crowded out by it. Wow. I'm, I'm, this, uh, now the wheels are turning in my head all of a sudden. <laughs> see, that's good. Yeah. This is why I save all, um, not all, but most of the pots that I buy trees or shrubs or perennials or whatever in because I just never know. I mean, that's what I'll use is a big pot that a short, some shrub or a tree or something came in just one of those plastic nursery pots and plunge it right in there. Yeah. It is surprising how expensive plastic garden pots are if you just need to go get one. And yet when you buy big stuff, so I have a few in the back of the garage or actually they're in the shed and they're really handy for moving stuff too. Yeah, and because, unfortunately, one of the garden industry's, like, dirtiest little secrets that they can't figure out how to handle yet, most of those pots are not actually recyclable. Right. So if you can find another use for them, so much the better. 
So the big question that we've been uh, talking about on the Garden Fork Back Channel is how do you mount this thing? How do you put this thing in your garden and not have it sink into the ground or tip to the side? Because it's, it's a tremendous amount of weight in a very small footprint, correct? Exactly. So the footprint of the pedestal itself is, um, I think it's 20 inches square. So, so 20 that's by the 20. bottom. Yeah. So 20 by 20 for the bottom of the pedestal. And then of course, because this earth, so the, I forget the exact height, but the total height of this is going to be 50 inches. So it's pedestal and then urn and at the top of the urn, it's 50, 48 or 50 inches, something like that. So, I mean, this is high. It's not, you know, the, the center of gravity is yeah. definitely up in the air on this. So there are some, some physics are not, working with us on this scenario. And of course, normally this is the kind of thing that most people would just put on you know, a patio or yes. on a, you know, so I am doing something as per usual. I never do anything the normal way <laughs> because I am putting this in the middle of a garden that has been a garden for, oh, well, I don't know how long, but certainly at least 20 years. And the soil is really nice garden soil. So it's also pretty fluffy, nice, you know, malleable garden soil. It's not like this is dense old turf soil or something. So All right. it's soft soil. So that's where what we're at. That was my question, whether it was sandy or clay soil or what. And um, it's not watery underneath. No. So there's, there's the engineering. The engineering side of me would think to um, use a post hole digger and go down below your frost line, which is what, three feet? Yep. And then at the bottom of that, if you can with the post hole digger or with a shovel, kind of mushroom out the bottom of your cylinder kind of hole and then put in what is, I think it's a commercial name, it's called a sauna tube, which is a cardboard, it looks like an oversized cardboard paper towel tube. And I would get like a six or eight incher and put that all the way down to the bottom. And I would pour cement in there. And then as the cement goes down, I lift up the tube a little bit so that we form like a, a mushroom, an upside down mushroom at the bottom of the sauna tube. So essentially we're creating a fatter footprint at the bottom of this. And then I would set the sauna tube so that it's slightly above your current soil level and then I would let it dry for a couple of days with a like at the home improvement stores you have different levels or qualities of cement and they all have different some of them are for sidewalk repair you want a high quality cement that's for doing slabs four inches or thicker or you might actually be able to ask someone there which one to use and I would let that cure for a couple of days and then I would use that as the base of the urn. That's the overbuilt. That's the engineering part of me is how to do that. But I have a couple other ideas as well. So my first question for you is, do you really think we need to go down below the frost line for this? Because first I, of it all, depends on the how frost much line is still frozen. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, that's a really long way. Does that soil heave a lot in the spring? No, it doesn't. Okay. Because I was just thinking about in the, when it, I mean, we have some parts of our yard that just get saturated with water and then they heave. It looks like, it almost looks like, not it's like stray. It looks like mountains sticking up, little mini mountains sticking up in the frost. It's just a tremendous amount of weight and put in one place. Cause I'm also thinking of it settling. And right. if you did a, essentially a, concrete column an upside down concrete column with a big foot it would not settle nearly as much as one of the other ideas my other idea is to essentially pour a six inch deep 24 by 24 slab of cement that again is level with your slightly above your soil level uh, i'd put some rebar in there and make like a square of rebar and let that set and that will take the weight and distribute it over 24 inches by 24 inches. And I, that, I would think that would keep it from settling into the soil. 
And then I have a third idea. You want to hear the third idea? I, you bet I do. I take the biggest concrete pavers you can find from the home improvement store or the garden store and take four of them and make essentially a big square out of four squares and then just put the urn on top of that. Okay. You're wanting to distribute the weight of that urn, which is coming down an essential area over a wider footprint to keep it from sinking into the ground. Right. So I have also sort of asked other people what they've done in this scenario. And what? I want to share you with you somebody else. I, I know. I mean, <laughs> I knew you would have the best answer, but I just wanted to share some of the other things that other people have done. So they're kind of variations on the same theme. One, um, and, and this was sort of based off of, I mean, this is a different scenario and I can see why there's a difference here, but this was somebody who had built a shed and said, well, for the footings of the shed, why wouldn't you just do it like footings for a shed? And they did, you know, compact it, you know, dug however deep, pick a, pick a depth, maybe 18 inches, 12 inches, whatever, um, did road base in the base of that compacted that. And then, you know, a layer of gravel for some permeability or leveling ability on top of that. Mm -hmm. So that was one option. And conceivably, you would do that. I think all of these things, whatever. I mean, I think one of the things that is kind of a no non-discussion point here is that whatever the top layer is, it's got to be basically, you know, 24 by 24 or whatever um, to, you know, be bigger than the base of that that um, pedestal. Yep. The other thing that somebody told me was this was somebody who did place a very heavy container, like probably bigger than the one I'm doing, although a slightly different shape, so not so wide, and therefore I feel like the center of gravity is not quite so bad on it. This is quite a wide, wide pot. So they did kind of that same thing where they did, you know, the road, essentially built, they said, well, basically we built a mini patio. So yeah. they dug dug it out, put in the road base, compacted all that, and then they built a brick pad and used um, that um, that filler sand, you know, that that bonds, Trap that bonding dust. sand. Oh yeah, yeah, bond, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that bonding sand sand between the joints, and that's how they did. Now they did put theirs directly on soil. However, this soil, I mean, like the soil that we're working, in, this is, happens to be in a part of the garden where I built up soil. This was a burn. I mean, back, back 18 years ago, you know, this, this was soil that I brought in mm -hmm. and built up a little bit of a berm in the middle of this garden. So this is not, you know, compacted over the years kind of soil, which theirs may have been. Do you lie awake at night wondering what is Eric up to now? You do, don't you? I have the solution for this. You can get those answers for $5 a month. That's what we're asking if you'd like to become a contributing regular supporter of Garden Fork through our Patreon program, is it called? I don't know, we use this site called Patreon. It makes it really easy for you and really easy for me. Uh, I wouldn't say every day, but a lot during the week. I post pictures and just thoughts and audio musings and stuff. Um, the last kind of audio talk was, I thought, too much information, um, but I shared it anyway. Um, and so that's what you get if you want to wonder what I, this is, I'm just rambling, aren't I? Anyway, just asking you if you want to support the show. Um, I'm asking for $5 a month. You get the episodes. You also get photos that I don't really like. I'm not really big on sharing everything with Facebook and Instagram. But the core group of supporters who know who they are, they're almost all podcast listeners, actually. Um, anyway, so I share that with you when you become a patron. It's really simple to sign up. Patreon has an app that you can put on your phone or your iPad. And every time I post something, you will get an email notification. And also, if you have notifications turned on for the Patreon app, you get a little bing. And, oh, Eric has posted a photo or Eric has posted a, an audio clip. And you also get the after show of Garden Fork Radio. So that's me and my friends after we're done doing the half hour of For Everyone. We do like five or ten minutes of uh, 
I just call it the after show. It, it's sometimes it's something we forgot to bring up in the show. And I think it's interesting. The patrons that have told me said that they like it too. So think about that. If you want to sign up, the information is in the show notes here. You can also go to patreon.com slash garden fork. That's patreon.com slash garden fork or links in the show notes here. All right, back to the show. So in my third idea of the big pavers, I would put, um, you could do sand or something and then uh, like a three quarter one inch stone and then the pavers because that would allow drainage below the pavers so they wouldn't heave if there mm-hmm. got to be too much water underneath there. I, that's the simplest one and that's the one I would go with. Okay. All right. I like simple. I like simple and I, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm a little afraid of a lot of concrete to be perfectly honest, just cause it's such a mess and you gotta deal with all that stuff. Oh, I do have one other question for you related to this, which is that, um, this thing showed up yesterday. Maybe I'll take a picture of it. And if you want to, you can send that out to the yeah. um, patrons. Um, once we get it unearthed, it's, it came, well, I sent you the picture of it. It came in a, in a pallet tomb. Yes. It is in like a pallet coffin and, and, and pry bars and tools are necessary to really get at it. But the um, bowl sits on top of the little pedestal part. The little pedestal part is incredibly small. And I'm like, so that bowl is going to sit on top of that? And I did read the directions and they say that you should use waterproof masonry mortar to connect the two pieces. Oh, interesting. Do you know anything, do you know anything about waterproof masonry mortar? And is that something that I can buy in a tube or am I going to have to mix something up? It sounds like hydraulic cement. Um, you can buy, you can buy cement and small, um, it looks like an oversized uh, Cool Whip container. Oh, okay. Or they sell it. Some of them sell it in little bags. It looks like a bag of rice. Oh, you know, okay. That size Good. rice. So you can buy small quantities of it. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I actually thought they were going to say um, you should use like uh, a poly- polyurethane glue like liquid nails or something like that. Huh. That's actually what I would have thought. And I was going to ask you what you thought about that because honestly, that's that's a little easier to be honest. But yeah, I would have, I would have thought that that's, that's what they would have said too. I guess they're just wanting to keep water from getting between the two objects. Right. Now, fortunately this thing, the whole system is, is, is designed pretty cool. It's got a, when they made the drainage hole in the bottom of the pot, it's probably a two and a half, two to two and a half inch drainage hole. So it's huge. Mm Mm-hmm. And they have actually used a PVC. They've made the pot around a PVC pipe. So it's actually lined. The drainage hole is lined with a PVC pipe. Oh, good. And then the whole system has the drainage holes that go all the way down. So the drainage hole will go all the way out the bottom of the base of the pedestal. Oh, smart. Yeah. And then they have, and then they also sent along little, um, really nice, like high density rubber feet to stick underneath that bottom pedestal, the bottom of the pedestal, so that everything is raised up like half an inch so that there's enough gap there for water to get out from the bottom. Wow. If you were doing uh, four pavers to support this thing, you could, uh, with a chisel and a hammer or with a, a right angle grinder with a masonry blade on it, where the four pavers meet in the center, you could just whack off, a, you could essentially chip off the corner of each of the pavers and that would create your drain. It would extend the drain so the water would drain into the stone below the paver. Yeah, good idea. Wow. Too bad you're in the middle of the country and I'm on the coast. Well, maybe you need to make a trip to Wisconsin. You lure me there little... with a fish fry, Friday night fish fry. Listen, listen, you know, the great tragedy here is that the Friday night fish fry experience has been completely screwed up by this pandemic. So we have not had a fish fry because anyone who knows anything about a good fish fry knows that carryouts generally are not a good idea. It's no. never the same by the time you get it home. Yeah. Fried fish doesn't travel very well. No. <laughs> oh, I remember the, I remember it was 
Etzel's Country Inn was the place we went to in uh, Lannan, Wisconsin, if anyone knows where that is. So think about that. That's Let- how- Lannan, home of many quarries yes. and much of this much of the stone that has actually been brought onto this property for various purposes. Well, we used to swim in a quarry mm-hmm. and we would go fishing in the quarries. I mean, there were a lot sure. of them that were abandoned, you know, and you could just go through. There was a kind of a fence, you know, and we would just ride our bikes down there. And yeah, they had old machinery in there and stuff. It was pretty wild. There you go. So you OK, so you think that that just essentially and how deep of a so how deep of a let's call this a pit how deep down do you think i would need to go with this scenario like a foot a foot okay so a 24 inch square foot and then build up from there yeah you gotta tamp the heck out of the stone yeah we do have a we i have it's that'll be my arm workout for this weekend yeah or whenever i do this it's not happening today (laughs) but uh use that tamper I discovered a long time ago that it's never fun to be the person on the tamper. So I have a tangent to this. You just put out a video about planting a fig tree in a cold climate. And and my home in Brooklyn, I live in Brooklyn, New York. We all have row houses. And in the backyards, uh, it's a protected area. It's a mi- macro or microclimate. And... The Italian, a lot of Italians lived in Brooklyn and they planted fig trees from Italy. And so uh, there are fig trees all over the place in my uh, neighbor's backyards and they grow. You you can kill them. You can cut them all the way back and they grow right back up. And um, it was just interesting. You're trying to grow a fig tree in zone 5B. And I'm like, oh, yeah, they grow like weeds back here, you know? Yeah. It's funny how how just the microclimate thing is more and more and more the microclimate thing is so interesting how different a specific spot can be it's so and of course i'm sure you get a little you get the city heat sink going on and everything else Yeah, cement um um it's it's fascinating fascinating to me yeah so the the deal with the fig thing is that that we can there is at least one or two varieties of fig that would be root hardy here and probably more than that but they generally will die back to the ground. And so if they do that, you're not going to get figs that say, I mean, you might get figs if you have a longer season, which we don't. So they're never going to get figs. So that only works here. That only works if you're going to, if you're just growing them because they're cool looking, but you're not going to get a fig and damn it. I want a fig. (laughs) So anyway, Yeah. yeah. So I did this, I did this video trying to figure out how to, um, how to do this. Um, so we're going to give it a shot this year and see what happens. I'm growing, this is the year of bizarre fruit for Aaron because I also ordered a kumquat. Oh, neat. So I'm going to try a kum. I don't, I have no idea what gets into me. These are things that happen in January. I order these things in January when, when things like fig trees and kumquats make sense. The, um, the fig, tr- the figs are delicious coming right off the tree because my neighbor's fig tree just happens to lean over the fence into my yard. <laughs> I am planting fig trees this year. Uh, I'm going to dig up the, I have this big hop vine mess. Hops are incredibly invasive. It's yeah, beautiful, man. but I have to containerize it. And I'm going to put two different varieties of figs in. And my neighbor is a botanist and knows all the exact place to buy the right kind of fig trees. So I'm very excited about that. So. That's going to be cool. That's that'll be neat. I have never had a fresh fig. And everything I keep hearing from everyone is that a fresh fig is so different from a fig you get in any other form that it's almost like it's two different things. So they're creamier. I mean, you know, you can get figs in a salad. I mean, you can buy them in the grocery store for about nine dollars for a little container of them. Um And they get kind of mushy because they've been traveling, you know. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah, we'll have, have to do some. Maybe we'll do a collaborative video on fig trees. Oh, that... Let's do it. That'd be fun. Both of us planting figs. That'd be great. Mine will be easy. Okay, it's in the ground. Right. Okay. Done. <laughs> oh, look, Aaron's still Aaron's still muscling a pot around her patio. <laughs> All right, everyone. So. You can find Erin on YouTube. It's the Impatient Gardener and her website. Just If you just type in the Impatient Gardener, you'll find her everywhere. 
Um, a lot of really fun Instagram stories and reels and photos, which I, I like Instagram, but I just get overwhelmed by all the ways to create content. I just post pictures of my dogs and maybe some fire I've built or something, you know. You're, Listen, you're there. Everyone, everyone's just there for the dogs. We know that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, Instagram in general, everybody's there for the dogs. I mean, that's everything else is just is just where's the next cute dog video or picture? Yeah. Which, by the way, you posted a great. Um, did you post that video? You posted that video the other day of the dogs running at the yep. horse barn. Um. No, I did one of them running uh, in the in the woods in the backyard. Oh, okay. But um, there'll be more. Actually, uh, the camera operator takes really good cell phone photos. She's very good at the iPhone. And then uh, I just go, oh, yeah, send that to me. <laughs> there you go. And then I put it on Well, Instagram. the dogs are so cute now. They're just nonstop, and they're so cute. So. They're great. Well, coming up, uh, making a video about it, we could talk about it on the show, is uh, the uh, do-it-yourself install of a uh i think technically it's called a pet containment fence but it's called you know the invisible fence brand it's the mm -hmm. it's the home do-it-yourself version of that which i just put in and we're starting to train the pups on that because uh we're all uh, like our last set of labs where they used the fence and it was great because they could just be in the yard all day so that's what we're working on now so cool all right thank you aaron that was um so you'll have to, well, of course, you'll be back on and then you will post some updates on Instagram about this process. So I'm very curious. Yeah, I will. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll see you all later. Oh, it's, if you want to talk to us, it's radio at gardenfork.tv. Go out and do cool stuff. And we'll talk to you later. Garden Fork Radio is produced by Garden Fork Media LLC in Brooklyn, New York. Our producer is Sean O'Neill. If you need an amazing podcast producer, visit Sean's site, seaninbrooklyn.com. That's Sean, S-E-A-N, in brooklyn.com. Our executive producer is Jimmy Goose. For more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes, visit hollowbooks.com. The music in the show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com. Music.